welcome everyone to Grail Sound Lab. So now we are back and we go down a little bit into the history rabbit hole in terms of frequency responses and target curves. Um, so I'm here with Axel Grell again, who's really a legend in headphone development. So nice to have you back, Axel. Uh, thank you, Jemo. So, and I'm here with Jemo Kölke, who is a legend as well. Yeah. Already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, so today, uh, as Jemo said, so we go into target curves and uh, the, the historical development of it and where we are today and what's good about it and what not. So I think I can start right off and uh, yeah. So in the beginning, uh, so really in the very old times, Alexander Graham Bell uh, telephones, uh, okay, one was happy when you could understand what the person on the other side was saying and you were listening to it. So the development of the headphone out of that was simple. Okay, you had one, two things and use the headband to connect them. So that was the, de uh, the development or invention of, of headphones. But the frequency response, of course, get, was getting better and better, but it was only limited to uh, the frequency um, range of the human voice, even less. So it was only from 300 up to 3,400 hertz. That's it. It had been uh, like that for a long time. And to transmit all the information in, from the human voice, so speech, it's okay. But of course, when you want to listen to a singer or um, yeah, so some other things uh, in the voice, so the depth of the voice and everything, it's, it's not in. But that was the first target to have a uh, flat response, more or less, from 300 up to 3,400 hertz. Um, so when it came to hi-fi, stereo, so <laughs> yes, each side was connected to a different channel, quality was going up, so uh, with headphones like the Bayer um, DD48, that was already a um, headphone not using uh, a magnet, um, so this uh, um, metal diaphragm, a magnet and a uh, voice coil around the magnet that weakens and strengthens the magnet field, but really a, a voice coil that is moving. Yeah. So moving coil thing, so all dynamic, really all dynamic headphones today are made like that. So that was a big step forward in quality. And that was one of the first good sounding uh, stereo headphones as well. And um, yeah, so when that quality was evolving and getting better and better, people were thinking about what is the right frequency response. So, okay, at that time there were already couplers, but these couplers were mainly made for telephone use. And again, People thought, okay, a flat frequency response on that coupler is something good. Okay, when you're listening to a headphone that is tuned like that, it doesn't sound good, really. No, <laughs> no. So, but engineers were always searching for something better. And so the next thing was, okay, when I listen to sound in a free sound field where the sound is coming from some source that is in front of me, uh, I have a frequency response from that sound to my ear, to my eardrum, um, that looks like, yeah, in a way, hmm, I don't know, but uh, you have um, a dummy head, for mm -hmm. example, representing yourself and um, so the dummy head has a frequency response. And when you look at the curve now, so I have it here, you can see it. Uh, that is uh, um, the solid curve. That is the free field um, response of, of uh, dummy head, a B and K4128. And so that is what a dummy head is hearing when he's listening to a flat sound source in front of him in a free sound field. Yeah. And, and just for explanation, a free sound field is, is an area where there's no reflections. So it's not really natural per se, because usually you have some sort of reflections like a room, 
Um, but, but if you have an anechoic chamber, which really dampens all sound, or you're really in the in the free, then there's relatively little um, echoes. And that is something that is for some like acoustic research really, really valuable. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. free sound field. So when you're on a field yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where there's nothing yeah. around you, but that's only half the field because of course you have the ground. Yeah. And uh, the definition of a completely free sound field is there is no ground as well you're standing on. So it's, it's completely free, but there is air. Very unnatural, but okay. So this was the idea behind it. And uh, yeah, so but that sounded much better already. So more natural depending on the recording, but not it was not the real thing. So and in the that was more in the 60s, 70s of the last century. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, millennium as well. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so in the 80s, there were something coming up and look now at the dashed curve that is called the diffuse field frequency response. And that was something that was development because you're not on free field when you're listening to music with loudspeakers. So, and yes, the music people were listening to were produced on loudspeakers in the studio. The studio has a very special environment. Um, and people were used or should listen to them with a pair of stereo speakers in the ideal uh, speaker positioning. So, so from the middle of the head axis, 30 degrees in that direction and 30 degrees in that direction. So a uh, triangle where all angles have the same um, angle so it's it's all uh, 60 degrees mm -hmm. and uh, that is perfect stereo setting for loudspeakers and yeah but you're in the room and you've got the reflections from the walls from the ceiling from the, uh, the, from the floor from everywhere and so this diffuse field frequency response the def definition of a diffuse sound field is the sound is coming from every direction with the same intensity. So you can't, when you're in a diffuse sound field, you can't detect where is the sound coming from. And you can measure it. So it's all the same. And um, so all the transfer functions from your ear, and they are very different depending on the angle. I'll show you a slide uh, that shows that later. Um, they are all different, but they are all summed up in the diffuse sound field and the average of all these transfer functions from front from all these angles are summed up and the average is made up from, from all these transfer functions. Yes, and the resulting curve, as I said, is the one that you see here um, as a dashed curve and you see there are differences. The biggest differences are in the frequency range when you look at it. Uh, so yeah, the main or the biggest dip for the um, free field frequency response it is at eight kilohertz and the highest peak for the diffuse field response is at nine kilohertz. And so that is the biggest uh, difference between the two curves. So there is a difference of 14 or 15 dBs between them. And and that's a, that's a lot really. So when you, um, have a headphone like, and there are headphones that were really tuned exactly to uh, the diffuse field sound curve because uh, there was a guy in Germany, uh, it was uh, Günther Tyler working at the, or for the Institute of Rundfunk Te Technology, so that is Broadcast Technology, Institute for Broadcast Technology in Germany. He proposed that the diffuse field frequency response is exactly the right thing for all recordings and everything when listening to headphones. And so this is part of the standard as well. Um, and so the Bio DT770 yep. was made to match that standard. Uh, the AKG uh, 240DF, and D DF means diffuse field, <laughs> was, of course. <laughs> the creative Germans again. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, well, Austrian. Austrians. Yeah, Austrian. yeah, sorry. Sorry. That's oh. OK. <laughs> so. Uh, these headphones were exactly made to match the standard. So um, 
virus better, but a little bit, yeah, a little bit too much in that frequency range above five kilohertz. So between five and 10 kilohertz, it was really too much, but for listening in a studio. And most of these headphones were made for listening in the studio. Uh, it was great because in studios, headphones were used as acoustical lenses. So really hearing the, yeah, when there are details wrong in the music, there's some noise in the recording or, or whatever is going wrong, some, some um, noise gates, um, you can listen to the slope, something like that should not be audible, but you can hear it very well with headphones that are tuned like that. And they're working as, yes, kind of acoustical lenses, but that is nothing for enjoyment, listening to music, relaxing. It's today we say critical listening, kind of. But I would actually ask you one question about the curves, and yeah. that is uh, basically the, the big notch at 8 kilohertz for the free field yeah. air curve. Where does it come from? So, um, oh, that's quite simple. It, this is, is depending on uh, the geometry of, of the pinna, so the outer ear here. Mm -hmm. So the distance between this part here and this part. Ah, yeah. So part of the sound coming from now from the front. So the, we are in the free field and it's coming really from the front. It's going like from here. And part of the sound is going directly in, in, in the ear canal. Mm -hmm. And part of it is going um, to the, is reflected here. Yeah. And uh, goes in the ear canal from, from this part of the ear. Yeah. And so this is kind of comb filter. Mm -hmm. So the face is, um, yes, it's inverted. It depend, yeah. uh, it's depending on the wavelength. And so when the, um, this is wider, all that happens because the wavelength is longer than, uh, half of the wavelength is longer than, it's more to the lower frequencies. When it's smaller, it happens at higher frequencies. Yeah. But it's always there. And it's very important for, yes, it sounds right, because there must be, when something is coming from the front, there must be a dip somewhere in this uh, frequency response. But as said before, Set so this is very uh, dependent on this uh, distance here, and that is very individual for every individual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, course. but it's yeah. it's not the case uh, when um, so. But when you create a headphone which has a dip, uh, a dip now at eight kilohertz, and mm -hmm. it works perfectly for the dummy head, it doesn't mean that it's right for you. Yeah. or for me or for someone else. Some people have exactly this 8 kilohertz dip. Some have it at 7, some have it at 9.5. So, But when the dip is there, but somewhere else is no dip, then it's not good, not right. Yeah. So it's there is that difference. But I come back to that later. Yeah, I, I would even say maybe much later because we've already talked a little bit. And I, I think this is maybe a good segue because so far it's only been really measurement. So it's really you have a measurement microphone head or something and you build a target from that. Uh, and that is how you arrive at a good headphone sound. But there is no human perception yet. No. And that is, I think, uh, um, maybe a topic we want to talk about next time. And, okay, yes. Um, so, yeah. yeah, would be great to see you next time when we talk about things like... Oh, yes, um, loudness diffuse field yes. response, which, yeah, where people are, their perception is somehow involved, and the Hammond target curve, which is something, yeah, takes a little bit longer to talk about that. Thank yeah, you exactly. very much, and see you next time when we're talking about that. Yeah, looking forward to it. See you next time. See you. Bye-bye.